to look at where the first thing is to look at where the question starts from right so this one says what's the most appropriate medication to add to her current medications right that's the first question here this one says what is the most appropriate medication to add to her current medications when questions like this come in the first thing for you to do is to see what what medications are they already taking and what they're diagnosed with in order to do that just move the sentences above from the question so this one says that he has been taken isocerbite dinitrate hydrolysin and he has stopped it due to side effects right what the condition he is diagnosed with if you move to the first sentence you can see that heart failure right she's 63 she's been diagnosed with heart failure she's taking furosemide she's taking bisoprolol she's taking elopril and spironolactone right so they're saying what else would you want to add they were on by dinitrate with hydrolysin but that was stopped right this is how you can scan it but because we're starting this we're just beginning to understand the things so we're going to start from the very beginning and let's read it this one says a 63 year old woman is re reviewed in the heart failure clinic she remains reckless on exertion despite being treated in april and spironolactone on examination the chest is flared to auscultation minimal ankle edema with noted sinus rhythm is there cardiomegaly the big thing that you find in uh, heart failure. Now, here's another interesting thing. They're saying the ejection fraction is 32%. Can any of you tell me what is the normal ejection fraction? What is the normal ejection fraction? Yes, what is the normal ejection fraction? Any idea? 50 to 70 is what Dr. Samir says. Dr. Samir says 50 to 70. Now, this person clearly has failure, Dr. Hiba, Dr. Bervan, they all are saying, they're saying, what should you add, right? So he's taken heart failure treatment. He has developed some side effects. What side effects do you think he might develop with hydrolysin? Voice is distorted. Better now? Okay, so what medication would you add? What side effects that he would have with these? Okay. All right. Okay, so is it better now? I'm hoping it is. Okay, so what would you give her? What would you add onto the treatment that she's already taken? Digoxin, okay. What is the side effect? That's the first question. What side effect she might have? What side effect she might have? Many? Okay, so you guys have seen the question. What do you think is that we're going to add in this treatment? This is not spoon feeding class, right? You guys have to answer, you have to think and use your heads. Should we add digoxin? Should we add low satan? Because we do not see cuff, so we're not going to do that. Okay. Do you want to add low satan, diltazam, isocyabride, mononitrate, bosentan? Low satan? Dr. Hina is cons consistently relying on the low satan thing. Let's see if that is something that we'd add. Dijoxin. Dijoxin, why? This person's having heart failure. Dr. Behram, Dr. Hamza are right, and after we've done this, this is a recall from 2019, right? Here is the sin. Dijoxin may be, may be helpful in the situation whether the patient is in atrial fibrillation or not. This person's on almost everything, right? This person's on almost everything, but he's, he's in heart failure. And if you look at his heart rate, that is 85 in the sinus rhythm right, 85 beats per minute, which is almost normal, but look at his ejection fraction. We spoke about the ejection fraction, which is 32, right? This is, whilst it's not shown to show any prognostic benefits in the future, but what it says is that you are supposed to take an ACE inhibitor, and along with that, you are supposed to add in 
the joxin, right? Here we are um, also giving them, you know, we're giving them ACE inhibitors, we're giving them, you know, we're giving them isocerbide mononitrate, we're giving them enalapril, bisoprolol, digoxin, spironolactone. In heart failure, we do add digoxin. And as he was having uh, side effects with hydrolysin and isocerbide dinitrate, so we have to give an inotropic. That's why we use digoxin there. Do you guys understand? A large proportion of patients with heart failure take digoxin for this reason. That is that, you know, uh, they would have some help in the heart failure uh, ejection fraction thingy, and it is an inotrope. This is why we add digoxin. Why would we add low sartan? He did not cuff because we are switching ACE with ARBs when we're thinking that they cuff. Did this person cuff? Did we see anywhere that he was cuffing? Not low sartan. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? This is the beginning. It's going to be a little difficult, but as we move forward, things are going to make sense. Any questions for this one? Because if not, I'll move to the next question. Yeah. All right. Let's move to the next question. Okay. Because I'm thinking you guys have no question. Because if you had, you would ask, right? Right. This one says, now this is interesting. This one says, what advice should he be given regarding driving? Now, this is DVLA, DVLA, thank you. This is really important. You would ask six question for this. You would have two, two areas, two modules where you would be asked questions from regarding DVLA. One is cardiology. The second one is neurology. The next thing that we'll be doing after cardiology is pediatrics, right? So this one says, what advice should he be given regarding driving? He's treated with thrombolysis and does not undergo angioplasty. So there's a 55 year old. He had an MI with ST elevation. He was treated with thrombolysis. Now, there's a particular criteria for DVLA for different kinds of, you know, diseases and how you might treat them and what is the ruling uh, where and how long do we, how many days after a particular event do we send them for driving again, right? So this person had thrombolysis and no angioplasty. He had an MI with ST elevation. In your idea, do you guys have any idea if you guys are in the UK or if you've heard how many days or what do you think should he be abstaining from driving? Cannot drive for 12 weeks, 12 weeks or three months. Cannot drive for four weeks, that is around a month. Cannot drive for a week. Cannot drive until an engram has been performed and reviewed by a cardiologist. Can continue driving, but most must inform deviated. You guys are saying do, cannot drive for four weeks. Okay, four weeks, Dr. Zoya, Dr. Zef. Dr. Samir says, fifth, cannot drive until an angiogram has been performed and reviewed by a cardiologist. Now, here's a sin. Here's a sin. They did do his thrombolysis. They did not do his angiogram, but they did do his thrombolysis and they did not do angioplasty. If you think it was necessary for him to undergo an angioplasty, they would have done it. But there's a saying that if he had an MI and thrombolysis, how long would you abstain him from driving? Should we just like be that you need to go for an angiogram and then reviewed by a cardiologist and then only you can drive? Or is, because you know, that's a time taking process. If you were in the UK and you were supposed to go for a procedure, they might make you wait for four weeks or two weeks, right? They, even if it's an urgent, you're gonna wait for around two weeks and then go for these procedures, right? These things, DVLA, S6, these things are something that you have to do it on the spot. Right. When you'd be working in NHS, you would have to remember these things. Right. So most of you are saying two. Let's see that. And then you would be dedicating a second a, a page or a portion of your notebook and uh, you would be writing whatever comes in here because this is important to remember. This is very right. Post MI, a person's not supposed to drive for four weeks. This question has come in March 2020 exam. It was there in February 2021 exam. So please do remember these things. Right. Here it is. This is really important. Please to take a screenshot if you want to. For hypertension, um, you know, you could take one week off of uh, driving if you are having an emergency kind of hypertension situation. For angioplasty, let me just, you know, just one second. Because you guys just see that, you know, this is a small screen, so I'm just going to tilt it. Okay. Okay, here is the thing. If you went through an angioplasty which was elective, you'd be taking one week off of driving. So this person did not go for angioplasty, right? If he went for an elective angioplasty, not the one that was diagnosed or told by the physicians, but if he went for elective angioplasty, he'd be taking one week off of driving. If he went for cabbage, right, which is coronary artery bypass graft, he'd be taking four weeks off of driving. If he had ACS, four weeks off of driving. One week, if successfully treated by angioplasty, one week. 
Now, how would you remember this here? If he is having MI, if he's going for cabbage, if he's having ACS, if he had an MI, if he went for thrombolysis, four weeks. Please write it down. Cabbage, ACS, MI, four weeks. Angioplasty, whether elective or successfully treated, one week, right? If he had pacemaker, any procedure that he goes through, almost one week. If he had an implantable, uh, an implantable, uh, you know, uh, defibrillator, one month, okay? If he had a catheter, two days off, all right? Okay, this is really important, the important ones I told you. Cabbage, four weeks, ACS, four weeks, MI, four weeks, angioplasty, elective, or if successfully treated, one week. If a pacemaker, one week off. Clear, guys? Let's move to the next question if you guys are following. Are you guys following me? Do you understand what's happening in this question? You guys follow? I need responses, yes or no? Okay. That is great. That is great. All right. Now this one says, this one says, what's the single most likely cause for the patient's current symptoms, right? They're saying, what is the reason that this patient's having current symptoms? Now, you know, if you read the question from down above, this one says, she's unaware of what has caused this. When you have vague answers, right? When you have vague sentences in your, in your questions. Now, this is a vague one. We don't have any information. Then you move up. Right, then you move up to the beginning of the question, right? Now, this is very vague that she's unaware of what's happening, what medication that is. This is not very clear. So move to the beginning, right? Like you have to go for the question first. If you have vague answers or vague sentences just up before the question, right? Then move to the beginning of the question. 51 presents to the emergency with his wife. He's unable to talk due to his tongues and lips being extensively swollen. Right, his wife says that while he's been waiting, these symptoms have become worse. She's unaware of what is done, but new medication by the physician does, did it. So what do you think he might have taken that has swollen his lips and his tongue? Remipril, simavistatin, omeprazole, amylodopin, bisoprolol. Which one is the one that causes angioedema? Angioedema or any sort of edema. ACE inhibitors, right? ACE inhibitors. Let's see if that is correct. That's supposed to be correct. Let's see if that is true. That is true, right? So I would not explain it. We'd move to the next question. All right. If you guys have any questions you don't understand, please do ask. Otherwise, we'd keep on moving. Now, this one says, which of the following is the mode of inheritance for this condition? Right? So um, let's read it. His family can understand how this happened. Again, a wake thing. So move to the beginning, right? His family can't understand how, right? I read this sentence, the last sentence for the question. I moved to the question, a sentence before it. It was very vague, so I moved above. A 20-year-old man collapses while playing rugby with his friends. Collapsed, young person collapses while playing rugby. Brought, pronounced dead following cardiac arrest, right? Very clear. Do you understand what situation is happening? What he might be having? See, a young person was just playing sports, right? He was, oh, no, no. When you say five, you need to tell me what disease are you thinking? Which disease is it? Can you name it? Can you name it? You guys are right. You guys have got it right. Which disease is it? 20 year old, a very young person collapsed when he was just playing a sport and he was brought to the emergency, he was pronounced dead and he was given life support, but nothing happens. The rest of the sentences don't make sense. And even if you read it, it would be only vague, right? So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? If you read the rest of it, it would say that two similar other cases of family members also died now, right? Okay, here is the same. A 20 year old should not have a cardiac arrest following playing sports because we are in our mid twenties or let's say late twenties or thirties. We do not, you know, fall dead while just playing rugby or any sports, right? We don't. The persons who have, or the people who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is an autosomal dominant, as you guys have said it, autosomal dominant disorder, when they are playing sports or any strenuous exercises, they do develop cardiac arrest. And they, this is a familial condition, which is autosomal dominant. I had made you dedicate a page to the genetic portion. Please write it there that HCOM is an autosomal dominant disease. Right, guys? I'm hoping you guys are following. All right. Okay. This one says, what is the most appropriate prophylaxis needed against infective endocarditis? She is known penicillin allergic. You guys have 20 seconds to answer this question. Read the question, 
and tell me what she might be having. What should she take as a prophylaxis for in infective endocarditis? 20 seconds and a minute. Okay, no antibiotic prophylaxis, Dr. Zoya says that. Dr. Bachchan, Dr. Nori, Dr. Behram, Dr. Briven, Dr. Samir. What do you guys think? Dr. Anna says three. Okay, Dr. Hina also says three. Quickly, quickly, guys, quickly, because you're going to have no time when you answer on your exam. And I'm preparing you. I'm not sure for this question, even if you're not. See, here's the thing. Even if you're not sure, just go with what you have read in your medical school. Even if not, then just go blindly and answer. Why do I want you to do this? Because if you do this, what would happen? That your brain would think that, you know, you got it previously wrong. And this time you would be doing all thing in your power when you do it again in your clavicle to get this right. So do choose something. Don't just sit there. Okay, do choose something. I know it's weird, but trust me, it will. You need to trust me, all right? Okay, so you guys are saying no antibiotic prophylaxis. Dr. Zev says five, doxycycline, all right? Clindamycin, Dr. M. Hamza says, Dr. Samir says oral clindamycin, Dr. Penguin, okay, guys, change your names, all right? Oral erythromycin, Dr. Berman says three. Okay, now you see this person 61, they're having mitral regurgitation. Where are they going? They're going for dentists to perform dental polishing. Now, first thing is dental polishing. Is it an extensive procedure? Is it a procedure where, you know, you might need a prophylaxis? You and I go for dental polishing. Do you guys polish your teeth? Or do you like the Tata and yellow teeth? Teeth. Do you guys go for dental polishing? Anybody ever went for dental polishing? Or you're like, we just do breakfast. And after that, we brush our teeth. That is all we need to do. You guys did go for that. Did you guys take any, if even you were pencil allergic, did you guys take any antibiotics? Did you guys take any antibiotics? Did you ever, by any dentist? No. If no, then why would you ask this particular 61 year old to take medicine? No meds, then no meds at all. Age dependent, you're very right. But here's the thing, here's the thing. I mean, why, why should we be ageist? We should not be ageist, right? Here's the thing. In 2008, they have said that infective endocarditis only needs prophylaxis if the procedures are not routine. Dental polishing is a routine procedure. So we don't need to know, go for, infect, uh, for prophylaxis, right? So when do we go for prophylaxis? When we are, you know, um, when we're going through the following, I don't think that I should read the minor and major criteria. If you want, you can. Let me just give you the minor criteria just once, just a brief review. If a person has predisposing heart condition, intravenous drug user, microbiological evidence does not meet the major criteria. Fever, major emboli, splenomegaly, clubin, splinter hemorrhages, Janway lesions. Uh, these are the ones that you see in the, in the macular um, or nodular lesions in palms and soles. Please guys, I'm hoping you're following. If you don't, if I'm going fast, please do let me know. But there is a lot of information and we need to cover it, right? So I'm trying to go a little faster than, you know, I should normally, right? Just want to make sure that all of you are following as well. Are you all following? Because if not, then I'll try to slow. Okay, I need a yes or a no. Because this is kind of an interactive thing, even if you're not following. I mean, even if you're not, not talking. All right, any questions at any point, please do ask. Right, palms and soles, this, this is where you have your January lesions. Your ossular nodes are the ones that you see on the hands and feet. Yes, we are coming to it. If even if it was a tooth removal and this person had a mitral regurgitation, Dr. Zoya says that if this person had, um, you know, a tooth removal and that person had a mitral regurgitation, should you be giving him prophylaxis? The people who are observing right now, do you think he should take a prophylaxis? Tooth removal, is it a routine procedure? Almost a routine procedure for all dentists? Yeah? Routine procedures do not need prophylaxis. Right, here's the thing. These, just remember this. Dental procedures, these are routine procedures. You do not uh, from prophylaxis. Sorry, prophylaxis. Upper GI tract procedures, like such as endoscopy, um, a rectal exam, et cetera, right? Genitourinary tract 
um, if, such as you know a urological uh, procedures for example you're doing a cystoscopy etc if you're going for you know uh, uh, tvg transgenital ultrasound etc and gynecological procedures if you're going for bronchoscopies right these procedures they do not need thrombo uh, prophylaxis even if the person has heart disease right no need for prophylaxis the conditions where we do need prophylaxis are the ones which are particularly more invasive and not routine, all right? Though they have given those here, right, okay? Uh, but I would not want you to remember it. However, because, you know, it's very extensive. If you have, if, you, if we find, if you find this inflammable, then remember them, right? This, these notes are very extensive. I'm just going for the things which are really, really required for you to remember for the exam, right? We'd only give antibiotics when the blood cultures are positive for any of these organisms. For example, if the person has amoxis, if the person has native evolved endocarditis, if the person has severe sepsis, if they have risk factors, et cetera, that's when we go for these things as a prophylaxis uh, antibiotic empirical therapy, amoxicillin, gentamicin, vancomycin, right, rifampicin. But just remember one thing that if there are routine procedures, because you know, mostly they'll be asking you questions about if there are routine procedures, then this is when they'll be going for prophylaxis. All right, guys, should we move to the next question? Okay. Any questions? All right. Okay. Now, this one says, which should you consider stopping? Right? Which should you consider stopping? She's functionally well. Okay. Now, you see, again, we don't want to see in our questions, in our, in our sentences just before the question, good things, right? Positive things or weak things, right? We need to see anything negative. So if you can see this cursor, if it said that she's unwell, we'd read this whole sentence, right? If we read, if we see, if we said that she's unwell, I'm telling you how to read the questions and save time on your exam. I'm also teaching you that, right? So if this was something which is said here that she's functionally unwell, you'd definitely be, you know, reading this whole sentence. Otherwise, move to the beginning. An 80-year-old woman presents to the clinic for routine appointment. Her past medical history includes ischemic heart disease, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and gout. Which medication should you consider stopping? Now, ID, CKD, hypertension, gout. What they're trying to ask is, which of the following can cause gout? Okay, she has chronic kidney disease, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, gout. Which of the following can exacerbate gout? Why am I telling you this? Because this thing, this particular word gout, you're gonna have it again and again in your exams, right? Okay, you said benrophilmothiazide. Can you, can you name two or three more drugs that can exacerbate a gout uh, reaction? Two more drugs? Any two drugs that can exacerbate a gout reaction? Any idea? Loop diuretics, all right. What else? Rifampicin, all right. Curosamide, all right. Lube diuretics, Dr. Pradesh says that. What else? Okay. Perzinamide, Estembutol, all right. Okay. Perzinamide, Estembutol, Purisamide, and uh, thiazides, right. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ethocrinine, right? These are the drugs that can definitely exacerbate a symptom. Now, before we solve this question, I want you to look at the ECG. All right. Okay. First thing, when you look at an ECG, what's the first thing that you should see? Do you guys remember we spoke about it in the previous session? If you see an ECG, what should you look at? What's the first thing that you should look at? If you have an ECG in front of you, what's the first thing you should look at? P wave. Do you guys find the P wave? Dr. Zeff says that you know you should look for a P wave. First thing is a P wave. In order for us uh, to, you know, like get through our exam of lab one, last question answered was bendroplumathiazide, Dr. Huskam. Right, thiazides are something that we avoid uh, when we are trying to, you know, um, avoid a bout of gout. All right, bout of gout. This is kind of catchy, you know? Okay, so look at the P wave. Can you guys see a P wave in this question? In this ECG, is this ECG visible? Do you guys see a P wave? at all, anywhere? Do you guys see a P wave? Yes, do you guys see a P wave? Anyone can locate a P wave here? Where is the P wave? Okay, where is the P wave? Where is the P wave? 
Okay, lead one, you see a P wave, right? Here's a P wave. So it's good you located a P wave, right? Now uh, in here also, if you look at lead V3, you see a P wave. In lead EVF, you see a P wave. In V6, we see a P wave, right? We do see P waves, all right? When you do see a P wave, then you need to see the PR interval, right? Why do we look at P waves? When we're looking at P waves, we're trying to find out two things, right? Because we're going for diseases in ECG, right? We're trying to think of diseases in ECG. I'm just telling you the process of how you'd be solving your PLAB1 questions for ECG, just for PLAB1. Look at the P wave. If you find the P wave, look at the PR interval. If it's more than 0.2, you move and think of heart blocks right p waves drop beats hard blocks if we don't see those things if the pr interval is not high we're excluding hard blocks from our diagnosis you guys follow me after p wave calculate the heart rate and look at the regularity of rr interval is the rr interval regular here is the heart rate regular here regularity of rr interval and the heart rate. Can you guys tell me what's the heart rate and if the uh, RR interval is regular? Okay. Okay, it's irregular. Dr. Zoya says it's irregular. Let's just take one lead. Let's just take one lead. Uh, let's take uh, let's take V5, right? So one box, this is almost two boxes. This is almost two boxes. This is almost two boxes, almost two boxes, right? Like here. Again, if you want to reconfirm, we're just doing it and understanding for the sake of, you know, our ECG exams, right? Okay. See, P waves, Dr. Zeff says to repeat. So P waves, you locate the P waves, for example, in here, in lead one, right? You see, this is a P wave. Do you guys see this very vague cursor? This is a P wave. After you look at the P wave, this is PR interval right this is your pr interval if the pr interval is more than 0.2 and next thing you see in the lead adopt beat you're definitely thinking of okay can you see this red thing right pr interval if there is a way if there is an increase in pr interval and then you follow this lead and you drop beat then you're thinking that this might be a hard block if not then what do you do you look at the qr complexes and the morphology and the regularity Right, because now we're moving to things such as SVT, right, uh, or VTEC or VFib. Because you know, if you had your atrial fibrillation of flutter, would you guys find your peeps in atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter? Do you have your PVs? Okay, Dr. Hinaya said that that it's Wolf Parkinson White. Oh, all right, we don't see it there. Right, you guys understand how we're going to work our ways for our ECGs of the lab one exam? Is it making any sense now? Because you know, I always hated ECG and now I kind of understand it, so it does make sense. Okay, you guys follow? Good, great. All right, so we do see that the R is regular, P waves are there. Um, and 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 you see this, this we do have a T wave. Is there any rays in the uh, in the QRS? Do you see any hyperkalemia? Because this is where you'd be seeing hyperkalemia. Now, after you've seen the RR interval, you've seen the P wave, you've calculated the rate, you look at the P, the QRS morphology. Look at the QRS morphology. Is the QRS morphology all right? Is it normal? Is it normal? Look at the QRS morphology in every lead. Is it normal? Does it look normal? Is it narrowed? Dr. Butchin says it's narrowed. It's narrow, okay? It's narrow. Now, what do you have to look in the QRS morphology? The first thing is the narrowing, right? Narrowing, reduced voltage. Dr. Penguin is very right. Dr. Penguin, could you tell me your name? All right. So narrowed and the morphology is narrowed and the QRS complexes have a low voltage, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is hyperkalemia. Right, in hyperkalemia, you'd see a dome, right? In hyperkalemia, you would see a dome, all right? You would see a dome. This is a dome. This is what you'd see in hyperkalemia. I'll tell you how, what does it look like? If, if it was a supraventricular tachycardia, right? Or is, if, it was, uh, if, if it was a ventricular tachycardia, right? Um, and what you'd see, you would see ghosts, 
I'll tell you what it looks like, where we're going to do it. We were going to do more questions here. So right now we saw that there were P waves, the QRS complexes or the RR interval was normal. The heart rate was almost fine, but there was a narrowing of the QRS morphology. So what is your diagnosis? What is your diagnosis? <clears throat> Based on just the ECG here, based on just the ECG, what's your diagnosis? Based on just the ECG, what is your diagnosis? No idea? All right, let's read the question. This one says that there is, there is a 18 year old female student, too young, right? 18 year old female student, Around one hour ago, she collapsed while playing football. Two blocks. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. What about two blocks? Could you elaborate that? Let's just read the question first. 18 year old young student brought in by her friends because she collapsed while playing football. She was doing some activity. She collapsed. Her friends mentioned that prior to her fall, she complained of lightheadedness. Right, she lost consciousness for a few seconds before returning to a normal, quite normal state quickly. All right, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've asked you to always read it from here. How to count heart rate? Okay, I'll tell you that. Okay, how to count heart rate? One box is equal to three hundred. This one box is equal to three hundred. Okay, this one box is equal to three hundred. Two boxes, one fifty. Right, then you need to divide 300 by three boxes. Then four boxes need to divide by four, uh, 300 divided by four. Right, that is how you'd calculate your heart rate. All right, 300, one box, two boxes, 150, three boxes around 75. And the more the distance between the RR, okay, this is an SVT. We're going to look at an SVT. All right, is it an SVT? All right, okay, okay. Now you see, I'm going to read, uh, do this question again. All right, here. They say, what's the diagnosis, right? I've said that once you look at the question, we are going slow because we're just trying to learn today. All right, I apologize for that. So, so it says, what's the diagnosis, right? So, you know, I told you that you're supposed to go from down above. An ECG was done. Please uh, hold on for a minute. ECG was done. Right on examination, the pulse is 121. Right, we see it here. Blood pressure is 98.60. Is she hypotensive? 98.60. Is that is that hypotensive? 98.60. Hypotensive? No. Yes. When do you say a person is hypotensive? I'm getting mixed answers. Um, 98.60. When? What is the normal uh, one? Below 90. Right. Systolic below 90. 60. That is hypotensive. This is 98. All right. Okay, so she has visas, right? This is her vitals. Now you've seen it move up after the after the vitals move up. In an ECG question, after the vitals, if you do not have uh, do not have the findings of ECG, move up. Eighteen year old emergency department collapsed, lost consciousness, was feeling lightheaded, then she quickly recovered. Now here's the thing. It's now we can have three kinds of situation here. The first one is hypoglycemia, right? For example, if you get, I'm sure all of you during your medical life, when you were students, right, you all experienced hypoglycemia. Did you guys? Because I did. And until and unless somebody fed you something, you did not get normal. Did you guys get normal? If you guys are ever hypoglycemics, you do take in some sugar syrups or maybe drink some juice or maybe take a candy in, and that's when you get normal. A hypoglycemic person, if this was hypoglycemia, they cannot get better without any intervention. This person has got better without any intervention, right? Three situations you need to think of in young people, young or old people when they are collapsing and they get better on their own. If they do not get better on their own, we're thinking hypoglycemia, we need to administer some fluids. Understood, you guys following? Second situation, that they are maintaining consciousness throughout, right? They're maintaining consciousness throughout and they, they drop themselves, they fall. Without loss of consciousness, they fall. Those are known as drop attacks, right? The third one is vasovagal, right? Vasovagal, all 
all right so this person is 18 year old she has been playing football she collapsed and after a few minutes she uh, went back normal her current medication include microgenon 30 right she is on microgenon 30 she has experienced shortness of breath central chest pain and 18 years old very important worse when she coughs all right worse when she coughs examination pulse is high blood pressure is almost normal chest auscultation reveals scattered wheezes what is the diagnosis is it an asthma attack is it pulmonary embolism is it acute coronary syndrome is it vasovagal attack is it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy what is it okay is it asthma attack is she having an asthma attack yes or no okay is she having pulmonary embolism if she was having pulmonary embolism she was supposed to be older should have some problem in her chest maybe has a fever maybe has a travel history we don't do that a coronary syndrome nothing on the ecg right hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy could she be have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy can she have that Okay, yes. Can she have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? Okay, no family history. All right, no family history. Okay, but she does have shortness of breath. She has central chest pain when she coughs. In vagal vasal attacks, in vagal vasal attacks, how do you differentiate between the two? Is it vasovagal or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? I've given you all the information that was needed. Now it's your call to make. Right, you're saying it's not the above three, then what about this? It's not vasovagal. Dr. Samir says it's not vasovagal. Dr. Samir or anybody, uh, tell me, in vasovagal attacks, would you have shortness of breath? Would you have wheezes? Would you have central chest pain? If these were just vasovagal attacks, would you have shortness of breath? Would you have wheezes? Would you have central chest pain? Just asking. Can we have that? And can that be triggered by, you know, doing some activity? Like, you know, what was she doing? What was she doing? She was playing football, right? She was again playing a sport and she's very young. So what could it be? Now, what do you think it should be? Because we're learning things, we're taking time, okay? So what do you think it should be? Two, pulmonary embolism, okay. All right, whoever answers next, I'm just gonna take that. Whoever says whatever next, I'll take that. All right, Dr. Behram has said hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I chose that, let's see if that is true. That is incorrect. That is incorrect. That is incorrect, all right? Present with pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, all right? Hemoptysis, as it's commonly taught. This combination of symptoms is yet only found in 20% of the cases. Pulmonary embolism is possibly life-threatening conditions necessary to be conscious, right? A lot of patients who develop pulmonary embolism, she's on microgenon 30. She's on COCPs. That is one of the reasons that she could have pulmonary embolism. She's having occasional wheeze, right? In previous question that we did, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, did the person have a wheeze? Did they have wheeze? See, when we have wheeze, when we have shortness of breath, we're having respiratory symptoms, right? Okay, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is purely a cardiac problem, right? Purely a cardiac problem, no wheezes. Vasovagal attack, no wheezes, no chest pain. Acute coronary syndrome, nothing on the ECG. In here, if you look at the uh, ECG, they do say that, you know, there is a tachycardia, right? And she has partial S1Q3 T3 syndrome, okay? However, just the questions and the symptoms should make you answer this. We're just beginning to learn. So definitely it's going to be difficult and you guys might have boggled your head with lots of lecture and the prerequisite things that I told you. But understand that if it was asthma, she would not be dropping herself. She would not be collapsing, right? If it was, if it was ACS, she would definitely have some symptoms of chest pain radiating somewhere. A old history, maybe having diabetes mellitus, maybe having hypertension, vasovagal attacks, just dropping, right? No precursor, right? No previous activity would have made a difference. 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as Dr. Behram had said, uh, Behram had said, or Dr. Bachchan had said, no family history, right? And in hypertrophic obstetric cardiomyopathy, as we saw earlier, no respiratory problems. So this is pulmonary embolism in a younger person because she is taking OCPs. Do you guys follow this? Do you understand? If so, should we move to the next question? Do you want me to repeat it or anything in here? All right, let's move to the next thing. Great. Okay, I apologize. That was almost normal, but we did have tachycardia. We had S1, Q1, T3. We're going to do that in the next ECG, inshallah. We'll discuss that. All right. Okay. So this one says, this one says, what's the most likely diagnosis? You guys have 30 seconds to answer. 30 seconds to answer this question. Without looking at the, at the options, tell me what could this be? Twenty-two year old, lethargy, dizzy, noted to have an absent left radial pulse. Her sodium is her sodium normal? Yes or no? Is her sodium normal? One thirty-five. All right. Potassium is the potassium normal? Four point two. All right. Urea is that normal? Okay. Creatinine normal? ESR, normal, what's the diagnosis? Okay, all right. Breast carcinoma with local spread. She is how old? She is 22 years old, nothing else, just lethargy and disease. All right, SLE, Kawasaki, Turner's, what is it? The chiasus, the chiasus arthritis, that might be the right answer. Let's see if that is true. Very correct, this was tested in March, 2020. I don't think I have to discuss it. If you want me to, I would, but this is fairly an easy thing to be answered. So next question. Now let's read this. This one says, what's the single most appropriate medication to add to his current regimen? You guys have 30 seconds to answer this. I hope you guys are following. We're just starting. I'm sure it must be a little you know, annoying to do this question, these questions and understand them in such a pace, but uh, this is practice for your final days. Right, like final days of exam. So 30 seconds. Yes. Dr. Anna, Dr. Bachchan, Dr. Baram, Dr. Baram, Dr. Shbervan, Dr. Safana, Pradesh, Dr. Hiba. Dr. Aram, Dr. Majabina, I don't see you guys answering. Dr. Nori, Dr. Riddhi, Dr. Shela, you're very quiet, Dr. Shela, how are you doing? Dr. Zoya, yes, what is the answer here? What is the answer here, guys? All right, what is the answer? Five, okay. Add etanolol, four, Dr. Aram says. Add a beta blocker, Dr. Rija. All right, okay. What else? Dr. Sheila, are you there? Dr. Sheila, are you there? I'm sorry to mispronounce your name. Okay, Dr. Pradesh says for it. Okay, let's read it. First thing is, first thing is, what's the most appropriate medication to add? First thing is, see what medication he's taken. Secondly, look at what he has been diagnosed with. So he's taking aspirin, he's taking some avestatin and lisinopril. He's been diagnosed with what? A myocardial infarction. Do you guys remember what are the medications that we add for MI? The basic medication thingy, we had talked about it. No, four A's, okay, four A's. So what does that four A's mean? Okay, basic, right? B A E S C. we did talk about it, I remember that. Okay, so B A A S C. yeah? Beta blocker, aspirin, all right, okay. Then ACE inhibitor, then sumovistatin and clopidogrel, right? So he's taken an aspirin. Okay, he's taken an aspirin. 
he's taking uh some vestatin all right he's taking lisinopril what is left what is left what is left here should we not make any changes should we add a mononitrate should we add a bisoprolol should we add furosemide should we add adenolol what should we add beta blocker so beta blocker best bisoprolol or adenolol because we have two beta blockers which should which one would you add adenolol or bisoprolol bisoprolol or adenolol just is clear yeah everything is clear but you know there is a particular regimen that if you are having an mi you're supposed to give them basic medications which is a b for a base beta blockers a for ace inhibitor a for aspirin s for semivastatin and c for clopidogrel you guys are saying mostly adenolol let's see if that is correct right okay you guys have said it i haven't said it it's always on you i'm just here on the clear right bisoprolol bisoprolol carvedilol and bisoprolol just remember like a b c right a is not given b and c are given carvedilol and bisoprolol are shown to reduce mortality right which drugs reduce mortality in uh, heart failure patients right which 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 drugs reduce mortality in heart failure patients can you name them furosemide has it been shown to reduce mortality furosemide have you ever heard of that yes or no furosemide has that been shown to reduce mortality dr breven dr samir repeat basic i would I'm just asking this question need answers furosemide has it shown to reduce mortality in heart failure patients no right no okay morphin all right you have which drugs reduce mortality in heart failure patients can you name two drugs that reduce mortality in heart failure patients lisinopril is an ace inhibitor angiotensin converting enzyme all right okay so furosemide is not Okay, all right. I just relied all me questions were fine. Okay, no worries, Doctor Zep. No worries. Okay, carvedilol. All right, ACE inhibitor. Okay, see, furosemide and morphine. Those are not the ones that to reduce mortality. Okay, the like furosemide wouldn't. The rest of the drugs do make uh, some difference in reducing mortality, especially a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. Beta blockers that we use are carvedilol. and bisoprolol etanolol is rarely used all right ace inhibitors beta blockers carvedilol and bisoprolol all right so you were asking about the basic thing basic are the medications this is a mnemonic for the ones who are having mi right so b for beta blockers a for aspirin a for ace inhibitor or slash arb s for semivastatin and c for clopidogrel all right okay now you guys have 30 seconds to answer this question just 30 seconds to answer this question number 33 let's be sub guys okay which of the following is associated with pulse's paradox is as simple as it gets it's one of the simplest questions i guess L, uh, lbf aortic stenosis hocm aortic regurgitation cardiac tamponade what is pulse's paradoxes what does it mean pulse's paradoxes that is correct what is pulse's paradoxes do you guys remember that cardiac tamponade all right what is pulse's paradoxes all right one is correct but what is pulse's paradoxes any idea what is pulse's paradoxes yes fall of blood pressure of less than less than 10 mmhg or more than that during inspiration thank you for reminding us that all right okay that is great dr preven and uh, the previous doctor all right this one says what's the single most likely diagnosis right this started while he was driving it was like linked with cold sweating and dyspnea he describes a burn pain as burning pain 54 emergency department sudden central chest pain abdominal pain for 15 minutes his past medical history includes diabetes hypertension the pain radiates to the jaw what's the diagnosis 
as quick or as you can, because this is very simple question. You're like, you know, this is this is something that we know forever. We've always done this. We already know the answer. What's the answer here? Am I? So definitely an am I. What else could it be? Yeah. Okay, that is correct. Let's move to the next question. We're not discussing it. Next question. The interface has got really slow. Okay, all right. You guys have 20 seconds to answer this question. Not 20, let's give you 30 seconds, all right? Please, I do, I do need answers by the end of 30 seconds. Yes. Okay, Dr. Bervin says an ECG. Hot the ECG then. Echo. All right, what else? Echo, Dr. Pav. Dr. Pav, could you tell me what's Pav? What is your real name? Dr. Butchin says Echo. All right. Dr. Nori says Echo. Okay, Dr. Bervin also says Echo. Okay, let's read it. So this is a person and they're saying, what's the diagnosis? So his blood pressure is 120 to 88. On arrival, it shows irregularly irregular rhythm. ECG has been done, right? Irregular rhythm. Which conditions have irregular rhythm? Which conditions have irregular rhythm on ECG? Atrial fibrillation. Okay, what else? Okay, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation. Okay, so here's the thing. If these problems, if the ECG has been done, right? If the ECG has been done, right? And it shows something, there is no need to go for halter ECG, right? Okay, MRI, what is it supposed to do for the heart? CD scan, what is it supposed to do for the heart? Exercise testing, you'd only do these things or halter ECG when you don't have anything on the ECG and ECG comes normal, right? So ECG has shown something. And this is a 57 year old and they've collapsed two hours ago, right? All right, they are now fully conscious. It seems like a wall problem, isn't it? Seems like a wall wheeler problem, right? Uh, atrial fibrillation associated with maybe a mitral stenosis or so, or, uh, you know, aortic regurg, so with or aortic stenosis. So echo would be an answer, right? Echo would be an answer. Okay, let's move to the next thing. Okay. Uh, so again, you guys have 30 seconds to answer this one. Be very careful in answering this. Very careful in answering this. You guys have around 30 to 40 seconds to answer this. I'm sure you guys can do it. I need uh, all of you to answer Dr. Sheila, um, Dr. Brevin, Dr. Beher, Dr. Hina, Dr. Safana, Dr. Anna, Dr. Pradesh, Dr. Haskam. Dr. Haskam, did you get your answer? Dr. Hiba? Dr. Iram, you guys aren't answering. Dr. Hamza. And please do text me after this class for sure, definitely, because I'm going to add you to the group. Okay. All of you are supposed to text me after the class. Yes, what do we do? All right, what are we doing? Dr. Hina says four, Dr. Iram says one, Dr. Rija says one, Dr. Brevin says three, Dr. Samir says one. All right, so what do we do? You guys are saying one? You're saying, what is the most single likely cause of the stroke? And ECG confirms a persistent ST1, ST1 elevation in lead V1 to V4. All right, lead V1 to V4. This is a 65 year old. They have left sided hemiparesis. Dr. Samir now says three. Okay. And uh, and decreased level of consciousness. He has an examination, and there it seems like that their blood pressure is 145.75. Heart rate is 110, but regular. He's got graptations, mild ankle edema, myocardial infarction four months ago. Right? Four months ago, he had an MI. Right now, there is persistent ST1 elevation. What is it? Is it a paradoxical emboli? Because right now he's having left-sided hemiparesis. Is it atrial mixoma? Is it left in ventricular thromboembolism? 
inflicted atrial fibrillation or infective endocarditis. So infective endocarditis is supposed to have a have a fever. We don't have it there. Atrial fibrillation. Could it be atrial fibrillation? He comes in after four months. Is it atrial fibrillation? Is it atrial fibrillation? Yes or no? Look at the ECG. It just shows ST elevation. So we're dropping this. What about left ventricular thromboembolism? Is it left ventricular thromboembolism? Is it left ventricular thromboembolism? Could be. All right. If this person had left ventricular thromboembolism, would be having would he be having symptoms of uh, a stroke or heart failure? Left ventricular thromboembolism or heart attack? Yes, guys. Could be LVFR. Let's 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 put it there. What about atrial myxoma? Should we keep that as an option? Yes or no? I need quick answers. No. So we have paradoxical emboli and left ventricular thromboembolism. What do you think it should be? A or C? Uh, one or three? Dr. Rija says one. Let's do that. No, it cannot be atrial myxoma because we don't see that and the symptoms aren't suggestive. Here's the thing. Persistent elevation after an MI is because of left ventricular, ventricular aneurysm. All right, left ventricular thromboembolism because of aneurysm. Please remember that. This is also a question in flappable. Persistent elevation, persistent ST elevation post MI in anterior lead in an ECG is suggestive of left ventricular aneurysm. Please do remember that. This is a paradoxical emboli, but the reason this is was because of left ventricular aneurysm. Okay, yes. Yes, is anybody asking something? If not, then kindly do turn off your mics, all right? Left ventricular aneurysm is the answer here, all right? Left ventricular aneurysm is the answer here. Definitely something that you should look forward to. Okay, should we move to the next question? In Plabable, it does say left ventricular aneurysm. Please do look at it and understand this. All right, again, this question, look at the ECG. Tell me what is happening. Can you tell me what's happening in this ECG? Okay, is it ST elevation? Is it ST elevation? Okay, is it ST elevation? All right, let's see if that is true. So um, just looking at the ECG, is it an MI, aortic stenosis, aortic dissection, normal ECG, which high take off ST segments, they're just trying to get you pulmonary embolism. ST elevation. All right, MI, let's see if that is true. That is, that is correct, right? What else could it be? Okay, it's just a review question. Let's move to the next question. I'm hoping you guys can hear me properly. Okay, that is great. Now um, you guys have again 30 seconds for this one. Okay, 30 seconds for this one. Though this is the first time you might be seeing this question, but again, 30 seconds for you to answer. I'm preparing you from day second for the last day of your exam. You guys have 40 seconds to answer this question. If you guys don't follow at any point, please do make me repeat it, okay? Or explain it. But you guys have 40 seconds to answer this question. This is how it's gonna be from now on, all right? Unless it needs understanding, I'll be giving you guys 40 seconds and you would have to answer this, okay?
Yes. What are you guys saying? Hmm. Okay, Dr. Brevin says five, Dr. Nori says one. Anyone else says inside? Yeah? Okay, Dr. Hiba says four. Here is the thing. What is this person having? As soon as you see it, what is the next step in management? Let's read it. It says the person has, has shown an ECG, which has sinus bradycardia, 36 beats per minute. Any bradycardia, which is symptomatic, right? Remember this. Any bradycardia, which is symptomatic, you treat it with atropine. No questions asked. See, they are preparing you for NHS that you're going to work in there. If you guys are taking this exam for NHS, because this is obviously where you're going, right? NHS, you're going to the UK. They want you to come uh, go there and work like, you know, horses or maybe donkeys. Don't want to say this, but this is what's going to happen, right? I mean, I'm going to be there too, but just telling you, right? So they're just preparing you that you should be there and understand how the situation is going to work, right? They're preparing you for there. So if you want to go to the emergency department, what you're going to do, you're going to treat their patients. And how would you treat them? You're going to see a patient who has got bradycardia on the ECG and they're symptomatic. As you see in here, this is 79 year old. She's got shortness of breath and she's denying any chest pain. So she's symptomatic and she has bradycardia. 36 weeks per minute is bradycardia. As soon as you see nothing else, go for intravenous atropine, right? That's the first thing. You've done the intro atropine, not working out. Temporary pacemaker, TCM, right? TCPM, something like that. If that doesn't work out, then pace, uh, permanent pacemaker, right? Let's see if that is correct. I hope I said the right thing. Yeah, symptomatic bradycardia. This is 2019 November recall, atropin. This question also came in February exam of 2021, August exam of 2021. Okay. Okay, guys, I'm hoping you guys are following. Now you guys have 20 seconds to answer this because this is uh, something I'm sure that you'd be able to answer. They're saying, what's the most common side effect of AC ACE inhibitors? Please do text me after this class. I really, really want you to text me after this class. Even if you've texted before, please do text me. I'm going to add you to the group. Okay? All right. Cough and hyperkalemia. All right. Okay, Dr. Safana says four, Dr. Hamza says four, cough and hyperkalemia. Can you name two drugs that cause hyperkalemia? Two drugs that cause hyperkalemia. This is right. ACE inhibitors cause cough and hyperkalemia. Can you tame two drugs? All right, ARBs. Okay, apart from that, any other drug that causes hyperkalemia? Spironolactone, all right. Okay, what else? Thiazide, thiazide causes hyperkalemia or hypokalemia? Hey, guys, uh, thiazide causes hyperkalemia or hypokalemia? Okay, beta blockers, hypokalemia, right? We need to understand this Please, This is gonna be going on till the very end of your exam. You're also going to uh, be considering these questions when you're going to do the mocks. So do separate uh, two portions or just a small piece of paper on which you're noting things, uh, hypokalemia and hyperkalemia causing drugs. Do remember those. All right, look at the ECG. Tell me what's happening. Okay, what's happening in the ECG? By the way, this is also going to be uploaded on YouTube, okay? For all of you, because you know, I really want to share this with people who are taking it. Um, and from inshallah, inshallah, tomorrow onwards, only the ones who have registered are gonna get the recordings, okay? What is happening here? Is it atrial flutter or fibrillation? Look at lead two only, sawtooth. As soon as you saw the saw, it is sawtooth. Right, Dr. Haskam is right. This is sawtooth, nothing, no questions asked. You don't see the P wave, right? You see that QR's morphology is good, right? Four ratio one, Dr. Brevin says, very, very nice, right? That's a very good thing to remember. So what is it? Atrial flutter is what you guys are saying. It's a spot diagnosis. You've said it, it's not me. You have said that, okay? I'm sorry for going back on it. My cat scared me.
It's taking some time to load. All right. Okay, guys. All right. So uh, that is so many uh, uh, P waves, right? Like saw two waves, you know, like irregular waves, and then a QR is complex. That is for ratio one. All right. I'm sorry for the pause and the break because, you know, it just went away. We're going to do two or five more questions and we're going to take a Nima's break and uh, we'd come back again, right? So you guys have to be answering this one. This is really important to be understood. This one says, what should be her target INR? This is a 40 year old. She's on antithrombin three. She has deep venous thrombosis. Her INR is 2.4. Last two episodes of venous thromboembolism happened while she was warfarinized. So she has got recurrent um, thromboembolism. If this is a recurrent thromboembolism, what should be the target INR? Recurrent thromboembolism. We had done this yesterday. What is target INR for recurrent thromboembolism? Yes, target INR. Two or 3.5 or let's see if that is correct. Right, this was tested in March 2020, recurrent, recurrent thromboembolism. 3.5 is the INR, target INR. All right, we're going to repeat those questions again when we're going to do pulmonology fully, inshallah. Right, so this one says, what is the medication that they are taking? This person's got Tosid Epontis, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Which antibiotic course was he taking that has interfered with it? 32 year old feeling unwell on questioning, he states that he has recently been prescribed with a course of antibiotics for chest infection. ECG shows Tosid Epontis. Which medication might have, uh, you know, uh, given rise to a tosid epontis? Clarithromycin, doxycycline, amoxicillin, syphilixin, flocloxicillin. I'm giving you breaks of a day so that you also go through your plabable or your plab keys and learn with it, right? Okay, clarithromycin is what you guys are saying. Let's see if that is true. That is correct. Clarithromycin can cause QT interval prolongation. Please do remember that, right? QT interval prolongation by clarithromycin. Which drugs? Erythromycin, clarithromycin, ciprofloxacin, SSRIs, TCAs. Please write it down. Clarithromycin, erythromycin, ciprofloxacin, SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants can give rise to QT interval prolongation, tosidipontis triggering polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Please do write that. Trust me, I am making, um, I'm stressing on this because this is important. Tosidipontis polymorphic ventricular tachycardia by clarithromycin, erythromycin, and SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants. I'm hoping you guys are making notes. And every time you make note, a notes, please share it in the main group because you know it will help you and the people around. Maybe they'll question you if what if they don't understand your writing. And if that happens, you'd repeat the things, right? The more you discuss it, the more you say it, um, it's going to help you and it's going to help others, right? The more you help others, the more uh, help you you help yourself. I know I'm making. I hope I'm making sense. All right. Okay. So next question. I'm hoping you guys are following to this point. All right. This this one says, which of the following is likely to have caused elevation of creatinine kinase? Which would have caused an elevation of creatinine kinase? Which of the following can cause an elevation of creatinine kinase? This is a 53 year old. They have got muscle pain. They're taking aspirin, smovistatin, and etanolol. Which drug is going to cause an elevation in creatinine kinase? A 
Okay, simovastatin so with what can cause a, a elevation of creatinine kinase? Which of the following drugs? Is it amitriptyline, isocerbide mononitrate, erythromycin, philodipine, rifimsin? Okay, amitriptyline. Can it cause can it cause elevated creatinine kinase? Rhabdomyolysis. Okay, no idea. Fine. All right. Okay. Uh, Isocerbide mononitrate. Have you ever heard of that? Can it cause elevation in creatinine kinase? See, we are learning through questions, right? We're learning through questions. I can just give you the answer, but you know that way you would not be using your brains. Yeah. Okay, that's all right, Dr. Bachchan. I'm happy that you acknowledge this to be a difficult one because it is a little difficult. Why is it difficult? Because you don't know the answer. It's not difficult because it's technically difficult. <clears throat> statin, she is taking statin. So they're saying, which of the following can interact with the statin? You're going to remember it forever. This question has come in August, 2020. And this has come in August, 2021, February, 2021 exam and November 2020 exam. This is important. It has come in different sorts of ways. You're just trying to see what interacts with sumovistatin, right, the statins, and can cause rhabdomyolysis or elevation of creatinine kinase. They're always manipulated, but there is an answer to this. So what is it? Is it rifamsin, philodipin, erythromycin, isocerbine mononitrate, and metriptyline? What is amitriptyline? Is it amitriptyline diacyclic antidepressant? Is it a TCA? SSRI? Okay. Is it an SSRI or a TCA? It's a TCA. All right. Okay. Uh, can erythromycin cause in some way creatinine, uh, raise creatinine kinase or rhabdomyolysis? Any idea there? Okay, all right, so, okay, no idea. All right, uh, what about rifamsin? Can rifamsin interact with statin and cause elevation of creatinine kinase? I'm hoping you guys are hearing me and asking yourself these questions because the more you do that, you'd remember it forever, almost, like till your exam day, hopefully. And you should be writing these things down, right? The ones that I make you write. All right, Dr. Safana had said erythromycin, let's go for her answer. Dr. Haskam has said four. Erythromycin is correct. Here is your clincher till your exam day. This is an essential and common interaction. Please do remember it. It came in September 2019, right? It came in August 2021. It has come in February 2021. It has come in um, November 2020 exam. It is very, very important question. This has come recently as well. I'm not sure if it came in November exam of this year, but it did come in the previous one. So this is important. If you remember this, you, you would be, you know, almost solving one or two questions for your exam, right? So it's statin interact with erythromycin and clarithromycin, and they can cause rhabdomyolysis, right? Rhabdomyolysis that would lead to a raised creatinine kinase, all right? Yes, we are going to take a break just after one more question. We're taking a Namaz break. We'll be back in around five to six minutes with this last question and we're taking a break. I know I'm burdening you guys, but you know, uh, this is to build your stamina, okay? We'd be doing almost 50 to 60 questions uh, in session, in one session, okay? I think we've just done 30 maybe. Okay, right. This one says, what's the most likely diagnosis? Two days after an MI, Two days after an MI, he's having chest pain, ST elevation, upward concavity. Is it Dressler or is it acute pericarditis? As simple as that. Fever, chest pain, widespread ST elevation, Dressler or acute, ac acute pericarditis? Two days. Two days, guys. Dressler happens in weeks or days? Hey, you guys are slow. You're going to take time to dress. Do you guys take time to dress? I take time to dress if I want to look presentable and I'm a doctor, right? So Dressler takes weeks, pericarditis does not take weeks, okay? All right, that is correct. Now, now, here's the thing. We're taking a break of six minutes. Just one thing I want to tell you, the more you share this, the more you share your notes, 
you would help other people, other people, and indirectly you would help yourself because you'd be discussing it. Secondly, if any of your friend needs help and you think you want them to pass in this in this exam, please pass it on because we have just started this cardiology. Hopefully, this would help you all. We'd be coming back and we'd be um, continuing. For now, we're ending this and we're taking a break of five to six minutes. All right, five to six minutes. We'd be back. All right. And meanwhile, if you have any questions, please drop down on the WhatsApp group. Okay, let's end this.